Joshua Hernandez from Miami, Florida asks, What can you tell us about the eccentric and shadowy figure of Montague Summers? There seems to be very little known about his personal life. Have you read any of his works? If so, could you offer any interesting stories found in his writings or any anecdotes about his life? Please, Charles, tell us strange things. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Montague Summers used to say. Oh, really? When he would meet people and say, tell me strange things. Ah. And they would. <laughs> <laughs> well, firstly, is, uh, is this October? I know. The, the, uh, I thought we had the, the pumpkin up when we did the, the <laughs> Halloween show. We did. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of weird stuff out there, and you guys are right in the middle of it. Thankfully, here in the studio, we're safe from all badness. <laughs> anyway, well, Montague Summers was an interesting character. Uh, he was born in the late 19th century, died in 1948. He was raised, actually, one of the Plymouth Brethren. Now, that's not a religion you've heard of, but they were very austere. He became an Anglican, went to university, was very erudite, you know, Latin, Greek, that kind of stuff. Uh, he converted to Anglicanism, as I say, and went into Anglican holy orders, worked in a couple of parishes, was at a school for a while, and apparently there was some sort of scandal. Of what kind, I don't know. I wasn't oh, there. okay. And then he uh, converted to Catholicism, and that's where it gets really weird. Okay. Because he was uh, that he was ordained a priest, we know of a certainty. But whether he was ordained by a Catholic priest in Italy or some random old Catholic, that's an area of dispute. His biographer and, and friend, he knew him, was mm -hmm. the great Carmelite father, uh, Brokard Sewell, whom I knew slightly. Okay. Uh, chatted with on the phone once or twice and exchanged some uh, correspondence. And Father Sewell was a uh, interesting man all in himself, Carmelite, and the editor of their magazine, uh, Blackfriars, I think it was called. Anyway, Whitefriars? Well, whatever it was. Whitefriars, yeah, it was Whitefriars magazine. He, uh, uh, he was of the opinion that uh, he had, in fact, been uh, ordained by a priest in Italy. Uh, you see, in those days, there were tons of tiny dioceses in Italy. There still are, but there were many more. They've amalgamated a lot of them since the council. Uh, and that uh, he was what Father Sewell believed was the case. He wrote a, uh, a biography of him, a memoir, and he also uh, edited um, the Galanti Show, which was uh, Montague Summers's uh, what do you call it autobiography. Now, Father Summers acquired notoriety in several areas. He never worked for a diocese, maintaining that as he was, his bishop was in Italy and as he wasn't uh, setting up a public church or acting as a uh, public priest, he didn't have to care, and he didn't. He devoted himself to different kinds of scholarship. He was famous for the restoration drama work he did. What does that mean, you ask? Well. The period after King Charles II came back to the throne, after Cromwell died, to the overthrow of King James II, so we're talking 1660 to 1685. Okay. Uh, sorry, 88. It's called the Restoration. Okay. And it was a tremendous time on the English stage. They wrote a tremendous number of plays. This was in succession to Shakespeare's time. Because remember, under Cromwell, uh, the the English stage was suppressed. There were no plays. Wow. Okay. So, there was no Christmas either. Anyway, um, Cromwell's gone. The Puritans are, are dealt with. The king is back, so you know what happened. Theater came roaring back with a vengeance. So did Christmas and Easter. So, uh, a lot of plays were written at that time, and... Um, Montague Summers preserved a lot of them, edited them, and belonged to a company that put them on. A lot of the plays that they performed had not been performed in 300 years. How did he get access to that? Well, because the manuscripts are still very much around, you know, in oh. places like the, just the no one Bosnian else... Library at Oxford and so on. And just no one else was interested? Well, they weren't when he started. Oh, okay. They were when he finished. <laughs> okay. 
because he really revived them. Now, another area that he was very famous for was his scholarship on the Gothic novel. Now, when I say the Gothic novel, I don't mean the kind of lurid-covered things that we had when I was a kid, where you'd have this, uh, this woman in a filmy nightgown uh, standing, looking up at the moon uh, with a, a towered house behind her and a light shining and the name like Mistress of Falkenbrook. No. Okay. Not that kind of Gothic novel. But basically what we would call today the horror novel. Okay. Um, starting with the castle of Otranto in the 18th century and going down through Dracula and Frankenstein and all that. Well, Frankenstein with Romantics, Dracula and all these sorts of novels, the ghost stories and all that kind of thing. Uh, that the uh, 19th century was so big into. Um, so he really restored, uh, wrote a book called The Gothic Quest, and he, he showed that these novels were worthy of scholarly attention, which people simply had not thought of before. Okay. And he also um, published two anthologies of ghost stories. So that's the second area that he was uh, famous for. But it's really the third area yeah. that our questioner wants to yeah. know about. And I'm not telling. Uh. No. Yeah. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Um, he was also very much interested in the old cult. Th there we go. There we okay. go. And specifically from the Catholic viewpoint, but from a Catholic viewpoint that modern Catholics often find embarrassing. Because you don't like to think about it. You know, that sort of thing never happens except when it does. So, uh, his first book to gain him a, uh, an audience in this area was called The History of Witchcraft, which he followed up. And in that, unlike uh, the modern theory of witchcraft, borrowed from the Wiccans, that age old religion going back to the 1920s. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, he described witches as being at once in league with Satan, individuals that sold their souls to Satan for power, um, but also connected it to the Cathars and the Manichaeans and people like that. Oh. Um, he um, believed it, you know. He be what, he believed in the devil or what? No, yes, what? he believed in the devil, but he believed in the possibility of people acquiring supernatural powers through giving themselves over to the devil. Okay. Now this is, I have to say, a universal motif in human legendary. Every culture we know of has a belief in people who give themselves over to whatever that people consider the powers of darkness in return for power. Yeah. Now, uh, the second book he wrote of that sort was called the Geography of Witchcraft. Then he wrote a couple more books. One was The Vampire, His Kith and Kitten, and then The Vampire in Europe. And he shocked, um, he shocked the uh, then contemporary imagination by positing that uh, there was reality to the vampire stories. Then he wrote a book called The Werewolf. Wow. Then he wrote The Physical Phenomena of Mysticism. He's really covering the whole spectrum, isn't he? He sure <laughs> did. He sure did. But the thing is, unlike so many writers in these areas today, um, even uh, writers of, uh, shall we say, uh, theological works, he backed up everything he could with the best possible sources. So... That is the work of Montague Summers. Now, supposedly, the story goes that he got this interest before he became a priest, oddly enough. Uh, he went to a black mass in Brussels while he was still in Anglican. Belgium, that is. Right. And apparently, so the story goes, what he saw there frightened him out of his wits. And that was what propelled him to become first Anglican, then Catholic, and then a priest. Um, he did a lot of traveling into very strange, out-of-the-way places and apparently had a few very bizarre adventures. 
But they told the funny stories about him in Oxford, where he lived. The story goes that you would see him walking down the street, accompanied either by a large black dog or a little child, but never by both. <laughs> the implication okay. being that it was his familiar. And then there was the, uh, the story of um, his walking down. He was a tubby guy, and he always wore a cassock. And a, and a Beretta. He never never ran around in civilian clothes. Yeah. So he was walking down the street in Oxford and uh, he gets hit by a bicyclist, a young, college, a young university goer. The, the bicyclist goes flying, you know, off his bicycle. And Summers is lying there in the street. So they both pick themselves up, brush themselves off. But when, at the point of impact, the cyclist said, the devil! And, the, and um, uh, Summers said, oh, oh, my dear Lord Christ. Well, <laughs> when he was brushing himself off, he looked down at the, uh, at the collegian and said, Well, young man, you have proclaimed your God, and I have proclaimed mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and he, uh, he also uh, translated a lot of things like the Malaeus Maleficarum and Demoniality and all that, uh, which were um, standard books on these topics from the Middle Ages. Um, Demoniality is actually about the fairies, despite the name. Yeah. And poltergeists and things like that. Yeah, you've talked about this book before. I have, and his foreword is, about, is actually as useful as the book itself uh, by the great Dominican theologian Lodovico Sinistrari. So with all this kind of thing, he would, uh, you know, people would say, well, how can you really believe in this? And he would say, well, how can you not? Well, Malleus Maleficarum, that, that's witch hammer. That, isn't that like a, a Catholic teaching on how to... How to discover witches yeah. and how to deal with them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And he includes the papal bull who gave it its authority. I know it's embarrassing. Oh, well. What is that word my mother used to use in similar... Oh, tough! Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see what's the harm in recognizing that there is very serious evil in the world. Well, because if you did that, you might imply that we're not perfect. How could there be... Uh, mutatis mutandis, you remember um, the movie um, L.A. Confidential? Yes. Well, the uh, character played by Danny DeVito asks a, a cognate question. How can there be organized crime? in a city with the finest police department <laughs> in the world. Well, how could there be all this evil, demonic stuff when we're so wonderful? That's, that's very true. See? I mean, obviously, this would imply that we're not perfect. And also, we don't know everything. You know, with both with this kind of thing, which is more properly referred to as preternatural rather than supernatural, just so you'll know, and with the truly supernatural, the miraculous thing, Eucharistic miracles, mm. uh, weeping statues, apparitions of Our Lady, all that kind of stuff. That's, that is supernatural. Yeah. This kind of stuff is preternatural. But whatever it is, on some level, we human beings, especially we moderns, resent it. And we resent it because it has no business sticking its nose into our tidy little reality where we're absolutely free to kill infants and marry dogs. We hate that. Oh, our little hands flutter, our faces flush with rage. How can anyone believe in such nonsense? And as I say, as for we ourselves, we don't believe in it at all until it happens. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's a wonderful meme, you know, in, uh, uh, on, the, on the internet. It's easy to make fun of the Catholic Church. Until you have a demon in your house. I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly, well. So, at any rate, um, so I, I, I hope I've told you sufficiently strange things. What else you got? 